Hey, it's time for TV Skyrider. Oh, on the air. <laughs> there you are. Yes, tell us I'm on the air. Lost in the wilderness. Yay. Good gracious of me. Talk about technical difficulties. Talk about no difficulties because I don't know what I'm doing. That's <laughs> okay. That's okay. Well, Daryl is watching. He's actually, he, he just gave you some props. Did you see his little face? Yay. Hi, Daryl. I'm going to give you some props. Okay, here we go. Whoa. Whoa, look at that. Okay, I, I would give myself props. That doesn't work. Okay. So, audience, that's Daryl for now. But for those who watch the replay, I'd like to introduce you to Willa Brigham. And in case, um, I don't know, I was pushing pause and record. So I'll re reintroduce myself. I'm Patricia A. Murray. I post the Durham Skywriter. That's Durham, North Carolina's online community paper, which you can read at durhamskywriter.com. This is TV Skywriter. Ordinarily, I do this on Google+, Plus, but today I thought we'd try out Blab. And it's been quite an adventure getting my guest, but that's okay. Here she is, Willa Brigham. Yay! Storyteller. Welcome, Willa. Thank you. It's been a trial to get here, but I'm delighted to be with you. Absolutely. <laughs> and I want to thank our viewer. For now, it's singular, but that's okay. Daryl, who's in South Carolina, who helped with the the technical. Uh, in fact, that's his. That's your area, right? He, he used to work at Central. With the, oh, um, fantastic! So he's uh, familiar with the area. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you for listening, Daryl. Cool. So the way this works, Will, is that people like they they type in their their um, comments, and we can answer them. So you can answer me. You can answer the stuff on the side. People can jump in if they want, or at least they can ask if they can jump in. Okay. I can invite them in. So this is Blab. This is how we do. So let's pretend like this is a regular interview. Ooh. You how you got started with storytelling. I'm assuming that you were one of those active children who like to weave tales and, you know, perform in front of the family, right? I was. I am the only girl. I have two brothers older and two brothers younger, and I am my mother's only daughter, and I am her ham. I am my mother had she had the opportunity. Wow. When I listen to her, she tells me of the times when she was supposed to sing and she didn't have the dress, so of course she wouldn't go on stage, mm -hmm. or she was always weaving and putting things together and making stuff. Mm -hmm. So my creative side obviously comes from her, and I am the extension of what she could have been had she been given the opportunity. I got you. So the stories, the songs, the writings, the crafts, the music, the being a ham in front of the camera and not knowing fear is just what I do. Okay, wait a, minute. Wait, brother, wait a minute. You were never afraid to, pe to speak or perform in front of people. No, I've always been a ham. And the interesting part is if I was afraid, nobody knew it but me because I like a challenge. Mm -hmm. And if there's a challenge to be had, I have to rise to the occasion because if you let one thing keep you from moving forward, you will let another. So I refuse to let fear take over me in any capacity. I have to do it just to prove fear that it better get back because it's not going to be a part of my life. All right. So, ah. wow. Wait, okay, wait. Give me some props for that. There you go. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> so yeah. were, you, were you taught that or did you come up with that yourself? My mother is Miss Positive Everything. She never said we couldn't do anything. She always said it's all it's already been done. So why not you? Or if somebody else can do it, you can too. Or if you're willing to work hard enough to make that happen, you know, things happen to those who work for it. Mm -hmm. So she's always been the one who says you can, you can, you can. So I act like my mother. I tell my children, of course you can. Yeah. Of course you yeah. can. And whatever she said, she said it, meaning that she expected you to do it because why would you be given this wonderful idea or suggestion when you don't want to act on it? Right. So do it. My, my Mama, can I swim across that lake? Of course you can. <laughs> now, she did not say you need to take swim lessons. <laughs> That's common sense. My folks are positive like that, too. I'm just going to turn my phone off real quick. 
Um, my folks are very positive with that too, but I, I want to tell you a quick little story. I know you're the storyteller, but I used to work with this lady who had a fearless child. And she said she got scared out of her wits because the kid, she was take, she took her kid to the Y for the first time. We're talking about a kid who's maybe four or five. The child jumped into the deep end and started flailing around and had to be rescued. And the mom was like, why did you do that? And the kid said, oh, I thought I could swim. Ha! And she will because now she'll take lessons. Right. But if you don't plant fear into a child, they do not know fear. I think we're only born with two, and that's the fear of loud noises and the fear of something else. I can't remember. But the others are taught. So if you do not teach them fear, they don't know fear. My mother's mother was afraid of everything. Really? My mother didn't want us to be afraid of anything because it held her back in so many ways that she could have succeeded mm -hmm. had it not been for her mother's fear, not hers, her mm -hmm. mother's. So mm -hmm. you act like the people who raise you. So if you show no fear, they won't either. So it's kind of nice. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, so were you brought up by one parent or two? I, my mom was our single mom and dad. Okay. I have four brothers, two brothers older and two brothers younger. Ooh. And we were independent at an early age because we took responsibility. Mm -hmm. okay. Mom would sit down, us down and tell us the story. This is what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. I can only do so much. I need your help. So everybody had their chores and everybody followed through. I remember being a kid walking to the store on Saturdays to pay for the layaway, pay the house note, pay the gas bill. I mean, really, going by the bank and paying the house note okay, and dropping by and telling Mama we finished our task and then we could go back home because we live within walking distance of town. Nice. nice. And when Mom said she wanted something done, we did it. It's interesting that our responsibilities were taken care of simply because she taught us how. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, I was asking you how many parents you had because my mom, I was brought up in Chicago. Okay. In Durham. And back in her day, she was born in 1929. So Durham okay. was a small town back then. So mom had fears because she was brought up here in Durham and moved. The, they got married here. And then immediately they went to Chicago. Okay. Mom had fears because she was a small town girl in an inner mm. city on the south side of Chicago. But fortunately for us, and she didn't want us to go outside or anything. She was real scared of everything. Not everything. Wow. But a lot. Yeah. But her dad was brought up in Chicago, tough on the south side. And he, taught <laughs> us, he taught us that this is this is our city. Don't be afraid of anything. So I do take after my mom in some ways, but as far as the fear goes, it I think I'm I'm not fearless. I'm not fear. I won't say I'm fearless, but I have more fearless tendencies because of my dad. Thank God, because there's nothing like being timid and afraid of everything. Exactly. When we go on vacation, my lovey says I lose my mind. It's simply because we're doing things we haven't done before. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to snorkel. So I learned to snorkel. And he wouldn't go with me because he doesn't go in water over his head. So as a consequence, I ended up driving the speedboat. I had never driven a speedboat. <laughs> I drove a speedboat across the ocean, jumped in the water and snorkeled, got back in my speedboat. Now we were following a group of us. And so I said to the ladies who were with us, their husbands were all driving. I was the only single person. And the tour guide said, you want to ride with me? I said, no, I want to drive my own boat. I paid for this trip. I'm taking this, baby. I what? was flying across the water like a bat out of heaven. I was scared, but I refused to let go. <laughs> it was great. That is cool. Now I have a um, some two friends. They're they're a married couple in in Chicago. They're from Brazil. They went to uh, Rio to visit folks and whatnot. And the what do you call the hang gliding? You know what that yes. is? Where you, I think you yes. jump off the mountain and yes, the husband was afraid. Of course. And the wife went ahead and did all it. right. And it she was like. It sounds like my son, 21, who wanted to jump out of a plane, a tandem jump for his 21st birthday. And I said, yes, go for it, darling. And then he said, I want you to come too. I said, oh, no, baby, it's not on my list of things to do. But then the first son says, but mama, aren't you the one that's always telling us to, you know, go the extra mile, plot your own course, be the exception to the rule? He says, besides, you have to jump because you have to have a wonderful story to tell. Well, of course, we jumped. Ooh. He jumped. His brother jumped. 
I jumped and my lovey couldn't jump because there was nobody big enough to carry him, right? <laughs> so he, he was at the bottom taking pictures, but it was exhilarating. It mm. just goes to show my children are fearless because they've been taught to be fearless. Now, what would you have felt like? Okay, I know moms can live through their kids and it might have been good enough for many moms to just let the kids go ahead and do that. But in the long run, how do you think you would have felt if you hadn't done that? Do you think you would have regretted that? Of course I would have, simply because I am the one who's always saying, give it a try. Go for it. You can do it. Step outside of your comfort zone. Or better yet, widen your comfort zone. I cannot be an inspirational speaker encouraging people to become comfortable with, with those things they haven't done if I don't do it myself. I have to be an example of what I speak. So mm -hmm. as much as I talk, I better do what I say you can do. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll be a poor example of a speaker. Wow. I forgot now. I introduced you as a storyteller. And, you know, I haven't seen you for a while. Yeah. For a while. So list again all the things that you do. Because I tend to think of you, Willa Brigham, storyteller. But tell us all the things that you really do. All right. Willa Brigham, hat maker. I love hats. This is my very first hat. Oh, I made it with the African American Film yeah. Circle. I didn't know you made hats. Oh, girlfriend, I make hats. You see this quilt behind me? Okay, yeah, beautiful. I made that quilt. I have, I'm a new author. This is my Thank book, you. The Pizza Tree. Okay. Okay. I am a performance artist. I write CD. Wait, wait, hold that up to the camera. Let's see. Oh, do this one. Midnight Quilter. Cool. I wrote about quilting and stories about quilting and raps and rhyme. Mm -hmm. I'm a midnight quilter in the winter time. And I wrote enough to create a whole CD because my quilt sisters love to hear me entertain them. So I took them and made them into a CD. So now I entertain quilters when I go to quilt conferences. That's awesome. Oh, As a writer, I get to write children's song stories and poems. Nice. <laughs> we tell us about your TV show. Oh, my TV show. Yes, I'm a host of a TV yeah, show. It's like TV show. A TV show. Yes, I'm the host of a two time Emmy Award winning show called Smart Start Kids. It's wonderful because it allows young children, preschoolers, to get ready for kindergarten using the behaviors that we teach that any parent or anyone who works with young children can implement and get the same positive results. We mm -hmm. results results. We want them to be ready to communicate by the time they get to kindergarten, and you can do it simply by watching our show and following our examples. We go to places all over the state of North Carolina, and we engage them in interactive behaviors, songs, stories, poems, dance, dances, movement, and mm -hmm. we visit interesting places all over the state with people doing interesting things that they can do themselves. It's a hoot. We have a great time, and the kids are delightful. Now, when I used to have cable TV, I'd watched your show on WRAL, but you were saying... It is still there. Yeah, okay, but I don't have regular TV anymore, so tell us, because you were telling me that I could still watch your show now. Yes, you can. You can do, go to WRAL slash Smart Start Kids and watch every episode of Smart Start Kids on computer. Awesome. Yeah. So, you, let's see. I've been here for about thirteen years, and how how long has your show been on the air? It's been a it's been on for as That's long as two o two. Two o two. Okay, two thousand. Our creator it was Lee Wing. She's gone on to walk on the other side of the earth, oh. and she is uh, other side of living. And she was a very creative mind with um a, the desire to bring diversity to children, mm -hmm. especially, and give them a voice. And we initially started out as a radio show and evolved into a television show because she just happened to know the owner of WRAL, who thought it was a great idea. He took it to the board. They were questionable, but he was he was convinced and he was right. It's a cool show. Now, Daryl was pointing out um, that um, although they moved away in 1999, um, well, you can still watch the show now. Just you yeah. said W R A L. Is it W R A R A L dot com slash, slash yeah dot com that slash smart start kids. Okay, smart start kids. Okay, and of course you did the theme music as well. 
Oh, hello, hello, and welcome to the show. From Murphy to Manny, yo, smart start kids. We're here, we're there. We kids are everywhere because we're on the air. Smart start kids. Lee yeah. Wing wrote that. She was very good at writing. We were so funny because she says, now, can you work with a Southern woman from Louisiana? I said, Wing, I can work with anybody. We had the most wonderful time. It was a great adventure for both of us. Mm -hmm. Now, was your show, when it first started, the same, pretty much, pretty much the same show that it is now? Or did you start out doing one thing and it evolved into what it is now? We are pretty much doing the same thing. We have added a couple of components where we have kids doing their, their favorite thing. But mm -hmm. basically, the elements are the same. We mm -hmm. engage children in help me tell a story, which is the same behavior I used to with my children when I was getting them to talk to me. I would okay. say, there was once a little boy named, and my son would interact and give me the name. And mm -hmm. they had the most wonderful adventure. They went to, and they tell me where they okay. went. And there they found the most marvelous, and they tell me whatever it is they found. Mm -hmm. But something was wrong, so they interjected. <laughs> so it was, it was spontaneous storytelling, mm -hmm. which is That's what great. I use. And they were always the heroes, and kids mm -hmm. love being the heroes. Absolutely. So, it worked for my kids, it works for television, it works for any child. And what kid doesn't want to help tell the story? Exactly. We also engage in some movement activities. I've got a master's degree in health and physical education. I love to play. My okay. job is to get paid to play for the rest of my life. <laughs> wow, what a nice but job. I always want them engaged in some kind of movement because I know healthy bodies builds a healthy mind that will last for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And if you take care of your body, soul, and mind, you need to teach them early. Move your body, move your body, and make sure you don't hurt nobody. <laughs> I really love that. Now, I grew up, like I said, in Chicago watching Sesame Street, Electric Company, and all that. My favorite segment of Sesame Street was all, well, one of my favorite segments was when they visit. I love when they would visit a factory or they would show you where something came from. Yeah. I really noticed that that is what I really loved about your show as well. Yes. It's amazing the. Many people, companies, and availabilities in the state. We, from the mountains to the sea, we have some of everything. I love it when we go to the farm and we actually see them with the horses training. I like it when we go to the milliner and uh, the bakery and they're baking bread or to the pizza shop and they let us bake pizza. I love it when the woman shows us how to use felt or when we went to see the whirly gig guy. I love that because yeah. I'm a big kid at heart. And for me, it's doing all the things I love to do. This is fun for you too. Yes, yes. I and didn't Darryl, know the mail went through so many changes. Via Twitter. Thank you, Daryl. I, I appreciate it. He just, he just shared the show via Twitter. I appreciate that. Yeah, he did. Yeah. yeah. So this is so fun. So when you do your storytelling, is it only for kids or do you go to senior centers or? or oh. I go everywhere, have contract, will travel. Everybody wow. is somebody's child. Mm -hmm. And I have stories from the birth, from the cradle to the grave and everybody in between, simply because everybody has a story. As, mm -hmm. as a storyteller, you can teach, educate, motivate, and entertain mm -hmm. if you have the desire. Little ones are wonderful because I sing it to them, I rap it to them, I talk it to them. Mm -hmm. Adults are wonderful because they listen well. They, they'll participate more than a teen or a junior high. And mm -hmm. my seniors are delightful because they can't roll away. <laughs> they listen to the whole story. <laughs> I love everybody's ear because there's a story for everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's great fun to be able to share because not only do you help them remember, mm -hmm. you also help them to retain, and you also open up avenues they may not have thought of before. Right. Right. So that's really cool. I was watching, now I swear to God, this is true. I was watching the news and there had been a, a terrible train wreck. All right. And, oh, Daryl, he has to leave. Okay. Thank you so much for dropping in, Daryl. And I'll talk to you later. And he's going to catch the replay. So that's Thank cool. Thank you. Bye, Daryl. 
I will also put this on, up on YouTube on the Patricia A. Murray. <laughs> that should be interesting. Absolutely. So I was watching this, you know, I was watching the news and it was a story about a really bad train wreck. People have been hurt and killed and whatnot. And they talked to two people. It was really interesting. It was almost like a cultural study of some kind, the way it turned out. First, they asked a white person what had happened. And the white person was, um, I guess you would say, um, well, I won't even describe it. I'll just tell you what the person said. Um, they said, you know, um, that apparently there had been, you know, an obstruction on the track. Um, there was, you know, huge jolt and everyone was, you know, you know thrown um, out of their seats and everybody was scared. And, and, you know, and so I understood what had happened because that's what was, you know, the white person explained. And they asked a black person and the, and the black person, it was a lady. And she said, and then the train said, boom. And I said, whoa, we all got thrown. And I hung on. I said, this ain't nothing to play with. Now, with the white person, I could understand what happened. But with the black person, I could feel what happened. You know? That's a different energy. Depending on the energy of the person, it's mm -hmm. definitely, we have a tendency to bring you on the journey. We add all the elements. And he said, boom, boom, shakalaka, boom, boom. And I said, get back, honey. It's going to be something going on in here. But the other might, might have said, and they made the most wonderful sound, and it was interactive, and everyone wanted to engage. Mm -hmm. See the difference? Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so actually, it's like interpretation. Yeah, I mean, both. I love the fact that this happened because with the white person speaking, you can get an intellectual accounting of what had happened. Yes. And with the black person speaking, you can get the emotional upheaval and the excitement and the drama of what happened. So and both, the, um, both worked for me. Yes. And the combination of the two tells the whole story. That's not what they, that's, I don't think that's how they planned it because it was live no. with the news. Yeah. But I, I will always remember it because it was so fascinating to see two different ways of telling a story. It was and that's crazy. why there's a voice for every teller. Every teller has their own voice. And you will enjoy listening to this one because it connects with you more than that one, which is quite mm -hmm. all right. But like I said, there's an ear for every teller. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to feel that you are, it has to be just one way. Exactly. As my granny would say, it's more than one way to fry that fish. No, that's right. Did you grow up hearing lots of interesting stories told by grandparents? Now it's interesting. I did not. Oh. Isn't that interesting? I don't know. I, I made them up myself, I guess, because I did not grow up hearing a lot of stories. Oh. Now, it was interesting that my grandmama had a jukebox in the living room, and I thought everybody had a jukebox in the living room. You all had a jukebox? A jukebox, darling. We would put it in the quarter, the same quarter, because it fell to the bottom, we put it back in. Because... <laughs> <laughs> but but That's interesting, but not the stories. I create, I, when I tell them now, I'm telling what I remember happened. So I said one time I couldn't tell my granny stories until she was dead. She was such a hoop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. what I tell, and I'm very questionable about uh, telling my family stories because I didn't want people to think we were nutcases and then you find out everybody's got nutcases. Mm -hmm. So it's all right. Everybody's family's goofy, right? <laughs> now we grew up hearing, now, Okay, I grew up in, in Chicago. My mom's roots are, even though my mom's from Durham, her roots are Georgia, um, and my dad's roots are Alabama. Okay. So, um, we were lucky in that my dad's mom, at least, and, and his grandmother, maternal grandmother, lived in Chicago. So we were lucky to grow up with them. Um, they didn't tell stories, though, not really. But our southern grandfather, my mom's dad, who you know was here, he had moved to Durham from Augusta, Georgia, um, he was the storyteller of the family. Okay. And boy, and of course you'd hear the same stories and because you want to hear them over, kids love to hear the stories over and over. I don't know why. Repetition. But, okay, okay. We loved it. But yeah. he was born in 1885, so you can imagine he had all wow. kinds of interesting stories. Yowza. And so I grew up telling stories when I would babysit and whatnot. And I still love to tell stories. I think that's a really good way to like you said, to teach and to, um, if you're talking to someone who's not black or from whatever background that you're familiar with, of share, sharing stories of your 
your family, culture, whatever. It's a really cool way to to share. It is. It's a, it's a fantastic way to communicate. And everybody has their stories. And if you listen, it doesn't matter what culture it is. It doesn't matter what country you came from. They are all very similar. You tell stories. I just got back from the National Association of Black Storytellers Conference and Festival in Arlington, where I, by the way, was awarded with the Zora Neale Hurston Award, the highest the storytellers have to offer. And it is like going home to a family reunion. It wow. is so fabulous because you have people from all over the country who come to this conference and everybody has a story. And it's amazing how similar and how dissimilar they are, but they're all in joy and love. And every last one of them has some component that you can take with you at the end of that story. Whether it's uh, education, whether it's a ism, whether it's lessons learned or beware or enjoy or give thanks, whatever it is, mm -hmm. everybody. And that's the joy of it all. You have more to share. So the more you know, the more you know. The better the story, the better the story. You know, that's right. Do, do you think most storytellers start out kind of the same way? Or, or do they all have their own separate stories? They all have their own separate stories. For me, for instance, when people ask, did you, did, I don't remember my mother ever telling us stories. Hmm. That's interesting. Interesting. But I told my children stories galore because I like telling them and they like listening. Anytime they get quiet and listen, you know, you've got them hooked. So for that time, you use it. I mean, you can teach them everything. I taught them via song, story, and poem to wash their face and make up their beds and pick up their clothes and clean up time and brush their teeth and stand in line. It's amazing what you can teach in a two-minute song. Interesting. Do you so think it works? Is, is there such a thing as a born storyteller? Because I know you've known these kids where you ask them, how was the movie? And he will tell you everything. And, he'll say, and then such and such. And then he said, and then such yeah. and such. And he'll tell you the whole story. And you're yeah. standing there for like 20 wow. minutes. <laughs> I would suppose that's a natural storyteller, right? Unnatural. They are very comfortable with their expressions and their communications, and they will do it naturally. Ask them anything, and they will elaborate for a while. As a matter of fact, what we try to do in my program is to help children feel comfortable communicating, and that is the result of our ex exercise, because once they can communicate freely, then they are more confident in delivering whatever it is, be it a report, be it what happened, tell me what you want, making a decision. Yes, we have natural born storytellers and then we have those we have to coach quietly, softly, gently out of their shell so they can grow more confident as well. Okay. But yes, we have natural storytellers and you can, you know, immediately when you meet one. Exactly. I'd like to ask you about the flip side of storytelling, if there is such okay. a thing. Sometimes kids get caught up in stories and it's for the wrong reason. They don't want you to think badly of them. And so they will lie. Yes. You know, who took this or who did that? And then they'll come up with this crazy story or maybe a very believable one. So how do you deal with that? You, we, I have found that I had to re phrase the question. It's not who did this. I wonder how did that happen? Hmm. Does anybody have any idea how this could have happened? Not that you did it, but how do you think it may have happened? So now I'm not accusing you. Heard the story though? Yes, but you're trying to get the truth. Whereas if you ask point blank, did you do it? They're going to say no when you know they did. Hmm. So you have to find another option. It's like saying you don't say no to a child all the time. You just find another way to say it. Hmm. Let's try this instead of that. Okay. You know, hmm. I really need you to put that back. May I have that, please? I need it. Whatever it is, you don't say no, 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 because that's what they're going to learn when you say no all the time. Okay. So okay. find another way. Okay. Okay. I've heard people say, I'd rather you didn't. 
It's yes, perfect. you see, which is perfect. Rather than stop that. Me as a child, I was like, "What is that?" I'd rather yeah. you didn't. I was like, "I think that means no." <laughs> uh huh. But they didn't say the word. Mm-hmm. It's like I never said my children were bad. They were mischievous. Yeah. Oh, okay. They were um, challenging. Mm-hmm. They were interesting. Interesting. But I never call them BAD because I didn't want to plant that kind of seed in their mind. I don't want them to be there. Mm-hmm. I said, you know what? I think you can make a better decision than that. Hmm. Is that really the way you want to do that? Is there another option? Another option? Well, I think. Yeah. So you speak to them as if they are young people, which they are. And you speak clearly so they will understand. And you're improving their vocabulary. You're helping them to comprehend better. You're helping them to understand better. So in all of those components, parenting is an ongoing job. And if you don't do your job, it's going to show. Mm-hmm. And if you do your job, it's going to show. <laughs> now, back to story time. Okay, so I don't know how this works. I mean, okay. I told stories just casually as an aunt and babysitter and whatever. But as a professional storyteller, do you have like a whole collection of stories that you have memorized like musicians learn music? Yes. Oh, oh, hundreds. Over a hundred stories, easy. Because every audience has a different viewpoint. I mean, each, if I told to the same audience five days a week, I don't want to repeat the stories. Okay. So I need stories every day of the week simply because I don't like to repeat myself. My attention span is short. I like something new. I'm like that preschooler. Five minutes? Oh, good gracious. We've done that already. When people say, will you tell that again? I said, no, I told that one already. (laughs) Buy my CD. (laughs) So when you... Uh, perform or tell stories are these yeah. stories that you have see I, I guess I'm trying to figure out how much work goes into it do you actually oh darling like um, Liam Farrell welcome to the show I'm Patricia A. Murray this is Willa Brigham storytelling so I guess I'm trying to figure out like do you work on a story the way a songwriter builds a song with a you know, with the correct form and yes, right chords and all that stuff. Yes, because I never tell the story the same way twice. Oh. It has the same elements, mm-hmm. but depending on the audience, mm-hmm. it changes energy according to what I need it to do. If I have an interactive audience, then I will definitely continuously give them something to call and refrain. Okay. But if I have an audience that just likes to listen, I don't do it as much. But when I'm learning a story, I have to learn every element of that story. I learn it verbatim, and then I make it mine. Okay. Do you um, practice in front of a mirror? Or do you video? I practice things? all over the house. I practice while I'm doing other stuff. For me, practicing is just walking around the house doing what I do. If I'm quilting, If I'm cleaning, if I'm cooking, I tell the story because I have to make sure I remember all of the elements. Who, what, where, when, don't tell the whole story as you began. Keep a bit of mystery to keep our readers guessing. And so I want to know all the details. Mm -hmm. I want to know all the characters. Mm -hmm. I want to know the who, what, where's, and when. And then when I put them together, I can weave it so it's actually like rowing a boat or riding a bike it has a straight shot but you know all the detours you're going to make before you get there how fun so yeah it is and when i do write stories i look for the things that are interesting for me Mm -hmm. that will challenge the children they need a problem you need to solve it i need a nemesis i need a hero i need people to question in between i need side tracks depending Mm -hmm. on the age group of the child Mm -hmm. or the adult so yes writing a story or learning a story is very much like writing a song except we have many more verses okay Okay. so before we go 
Can you tell us how we can find all of you said you have a book and a CD and yes, yes, yes. Book as a storyteller and a, you said motivational speaker, inspirational storytelling speaker. Inspirational yes. storytelling. I am the one that they usually put in to kick off their conference because I'm a lot of fun. I'm entertaining. I make them laugh. I speak on common sense, inspiration, humor. Don't ask me for time management. I can't help you. All right. But I can make you laugh. I can bring the to forefront the little things that keep you going and say, mm, that's something to think about. And she did it with humor. So you can find me at willabrigham.com. And you can find me at amazon.com for my book. Okay. Cdbaby.com for my CDs. Okay. If you want one of my quilts, send me an email, willastory at aol.com. I'm actually going to put some out there because I have more than enough. I need to let some of them go because my children threaten to call Goodwill store when I die. Oh, <laughs> you can't get rid of your quilts? So I have to let them go before I die. So I want, to, I want them in a good home before I leave you. I got gotcha. you. Yay. So, and you operate here in, in Durham, but how far? I'm in Durham, home? yes. My publishing company is In Gratitude out of Atlanta. That's my buddy, Linda Samuels. Okay. My um, other person is Stan McGregor at Synergy.com, which helps me with the creation of my CD covers and all. Okay. Give them a shout out because they're good people and I want them to know I love you guys. And how far away do you travel? Half contract will travel. I've been all over the country. I've told from Vancouver to hmm. Florida to cruise ships, which tells me, by the way, I didn't tell you about my cruise ship. I am teaching a fiber art class on the Norwegian cruise liner in February because my craft has become my avocation. And now, so I'm getting paid to cruise and quilt. Come join me. It's in February. That's fabulous. Could you do me a favor? Yes. I'm gonna go, I have to go check something. There's something making a noise and I have to check on it. Okay. I know, I know it's my washing machine is unbalanced. So let me go take care of that so it won't destroy the show. Can you tell us right. a story while I'm checking on the washing machine? Tell them a story. Okay. Right boom, back. boom, shakalaka, <laughs> boom, boom, hot dog, boom, boom, shakalaka, boom, boom. Now out in the forest where the grass grows slow is a great big tiger with corns on his toes. Boom, boom, shakalaka, lock, boom, boom. Mighty hippopotamus, a great big yak went swimming in the water with some birds upon their back. Boom, boom, shakalaka, boom, boom. Boom, boom, shakalaka, boom, boom. Down by the river, squeaky mice on rocks were eating popcorn and stitching their socks. Boom, boom, shakalaka, boom, boom. When there came a mighty roar. <sighs> and the animals knew it was the mighty lion. The lion made them shake and shiver and run. What did I say? Shake and shiver and run. Because they knew when they heard the mighty roar. <sighs> the lion was eating somebody for dinner. Now the animals no longer wanted to be the lion's meal, so they decided they needed to get together. And when they got together, they wanted to know, what you gonna do about that lion? I don't know, said the elephant. What you gonna do about that lion? I don't know, said the squirrel. What you gonna do about that lion? Nobody knew. But the idea was to feed the lion one meal a day. What did I say? One meal a day, and just maybe he'll go away. So the animals decided to tell the lion, Mr. Lion, we want to feed you one meal a day. So the elephant went down to the lion's cave and yelled in his general direction, we want to feed you one meal a day. And the lion said, do I have to come and get it? We will deliver. Well, that sounds pretty good, said the lion, but I like my dinner on time. What did he say? I like my dinner on time. Don't you be late, don't make me wait. I like my dinner on time. We can do it, said the elephant. And he went back to tell the other animals. Uh, the lion says he'll take uh, the dinner and, and one meal a day and stay away, but he likes his dinner on time. Well, the animals were so happy, they jumped and cheered. We can feed him one meal a day. When the little squeaky mouse said, what you gonna feed him? What? <laughs> Nobody thought about what they were going to feed him. Well, the kangaroo said, I have been reading about the nutritional value of tofu. What? Said the animal. Tofu is a nutritional value, and if you put it on 
gravy, it'll taste like anything you want it to taste like. Well, they thought that was just fine. They sent for tofu, it came, they put gravy on top, they took it to the elephant, elephant took it to the lion. Your dinner is served. And this went on fine for a few days until one day the lion woke up. Mmm, he says to himself, I want fresh meat. Uh -huh. I want fresh meat. He said, I want fresh meat. It's really sweet. I want fresh meat. And when the elephant delivered the tofu, he was shocked when the lion tried to eat him. He ran back and told the other animals he wants fresh meat. He says it's really sweet. <laughs> and then they didn't know what to do. They tossed around ideas, but none of the ideas were any good. Jumping Jack Rabbit says, you know what we need to do is somebody needs to sacrifice himself so the rest of us can live. Mm -hmm. Oh, nobody liked that idea, but nobody came up with anything better. So they went with this idea. Every animal dropped his name into a hollowed out log. And when Jumping Jack Rabbit pulled it out, he was shocked to find it was Jumping Jack Rabbit's name on the lip. Oh my goodness, he thought, this is terrible. I've got 500 babies and a wife who loves me. <laughs> but then he stopped. He remembered something his mother had told him. Small is mighty when you use your mind. The little guy can win every time. He says, I'll do it. I'll sacrifice myself for the lion, but I'll be back in time for dinner. And off he went. But the animals wanted to know, how can he possibly do that? When he got home to tell his wife, the babies cried, boo hoo hoo. And the wife moaned, oh dear, oh dear. But he said, remember, small is mighty when you use your mind. The little guy can win every time. And off he went to be the lion's meal. He said bye to the birds in the sky. He said bye to the fish in the lake. He said bye to the turtle, but the turtle took all day. And by the time the turtle finished saying bye, the sun was going down and the lion was roaring all over the place. Jack Rabbit ran as fast as he could to the lion. Mr. Lion, I'm so sorry to be late for your meal. But I was on my way to be your meal when the biggest lion I've ever seen tried to eat me up. Wait a minute, said the lion. Are you telling me there's another lion in my part of the forest? Oh, yes, there is. And he is huge. Wait a minute, said the lion. Are you saying there's another lion in my part of the forest and he's big? He says, oh, no, 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 no. He is huge. Well, take me to this lion. They went a-walking. They went a-walking. They went a-walking through the forest. Oh, yeah. They went a-walking. They went a-walking. They went a-walking through the forest. When they came through the thickets and the rabbit squeezed through, the lion came through scratch and crying and moaning, ouch, ouch, ouch. And when he came through, there was a big hole and the rabbit was pointing down. The lion wanted to know, where is this huge lion? And the rabbit pointed down in the huge hole and said, he's down there. The lion walked over to the hole, looked down in the big hole and whoa, the biggest lion he'd ever seen in his life was down in the hole. Well, Jumping Jack Rabbit saw the lion get scared and he wanted to know what you're gonna do, gonna do, gonna do. Well, tell them what you're gonna do. You're the king. What you're gonna do, gonna do, gonna do. Tell them what you're gonna do. Well, the lion didn't want to show that he was afraid. So he walked over to the hole and says, hey. And the lion down in the hole said, hey. I'm the king around here. And he heard, I'm the king around here. He stepped back. The rabbit wanted to know what you're going to do, going to do, going to do. Well, tell me what you're going to do. You're the king. Well, the lion couldn't show anything but bravery. He says, I'm coming for you. And the lion in the hole said the very same thing. The big lion jumped down in the hole, splashed around, and found that he'd been tricked by jumping Jack Rabbit. Because the whole time he'd been looking in the hole, he'd been looking at his reflection. The rabbit up high said, ha, 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 he, 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 you ate up the others, but you didn't get me, ha, 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 he, 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 you ate up the others.
struggles, but you didn't get me. He says, small is mighty when you use your mind. The little guy can win every time. And he went well, on home I, to his family. I know people love to hear your story. You tell them so well. I love that. Thank you. Absolutely love that. I hope they enjoy listening as much as I enjoy telling. My children tell me, you're the best storyteller ever. And I said, thank you, darling. You're the best children in the world. <laughs> yeah. You have to tailor your stories for different occasions. or, or You did say that you, you tell depending on the type of audience. Yes. But do you often have to have seasonal stories as well? Yes. Not only seasonal stories, special occasion stories, birthday stories, holiday stories. I make up stories according to need. I have had instructors say, I need a story on kindness or a song about kindness. Well, I said, okay, give me a day or so. I get back to you. And I add elements that they want in the story. I teach a residency as part of the Durham uh, Creative Arts and Public Schools in Durham okay. and, and as well as Wake County. And I teach via story, song, and poem, and I teach elements that they need to have covered in their curriculum as part of the um, school curriculum itself. Yeah. And in doing so, using story, songs, and poems help them to absorb the information better. But yes, on special occasions, I am speaking just next week. I've been practicing a piece for my senior citizens, citizens called If You're Not Dead, It's Not Over. <laughs> and it's all about taking care of yourself in your senior years simply because you've got a lot of good stuff left in you. And it brings to remembrance that they do and they have reason to live a healthy life because we're living longer. One in eight persons are going to be 65 or 65 years and over. And this is supposed to double by the year 2030. So you need to take very good care of yourself. And if a story or a song or a poem brings that to your remembrance, then the better off you are. You know what? When I was a little kid, my great grandmother had what we would call today Alzheimer's. Yes. She was in a, a nursing home. Um, we could no longer care for her. She was in a nursing home. And so I remember asking my dad why all of these old people were sitting in wheelchairs with, because they were mostly sitting with their heads bent like that. Yes. They looked really horribly depressed to me. Yeah. And I asked my dad, why were they all so sad? And he told me because they hadn't collected enough happy memories to live off of. Ah, that's clever of your dad. And I was like, wow, you know, that was pretty deep. That is. When I go to nursing homes and I go often, sometimes I will drop into one and I go to the ones who I know cannot afford me because you can tell when you walk through the door that there's some deficiency in economics. Okay. And I go from room to room if they're not gathered. And I just sing and pray and mm -hmm. rub their hands with, and it's amazing because they remember many of them way back. They don't have a short term memory. And if mm -hmm. you sing some of the old songs with them, they mm -hmm. will sing with you. Yeah. I, I remember one woman specifically, I was coming back from the beach and I dropped in somewhere near Swindler, Swindles, Swindler's Bend, somewhere down there. And mm -hmm. The woman said, he hasn't spoken in months, but he was singing with me. And oh. it's, isn't it amazing? They remember if you can tap in on what they remember. I remember reading an article about a guy who was about 90, and he was very depressed and said and very quiet and non-responsive. And his daughter remembered he used to sing to them all the time. I mean, mm. she got him earphones, mm. a CD player. Mm -hmm. And it immediately, the blueness left, his energy returned. He sang, sang, sang. You know, I moved, you know, I moved down here to care for my aunt. She had Alzheimer's. Ah, and, um, okay. But, you know, I learned that now, mind you, she never could figure out who I was. You know, I belonged to her somehow. And I would point, I, I blew up her family picture the last okay. time. Well, her family was together was 1949. Okay. Right before mom was getting married and, you know, moving away. The, the, the last time they were all together. Okay. So I bring that picture up to like a huge poster and always kept it in her bedroom. And I'd point at my mom and I'd say, who's that? And she'd say, Jean, that's my Jean. And I'd say, uh, that's my mom. 
I said, I'm Pat. That's my mom. And, and all she could say was, well, bless your heart. She never could make the connection. <laughs> she didn't make the connection, but I she said, knew her Yeah. But here's the thing. I learned that um, keeping in mind that she was used to being alone, all right? Okay. And I just came in every morning to wake her up, and she'd probably be terrified, Some somebody coming to her, her room. So I learned to enter her room in the morning um, singing or humming uh, an old song. Because I yeah. could hear something. So I come in. And even before she was awake, she'd lie there. She'd, like, she'd be like, da, 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 da. There you go. Say, Good morning. So we always woke up real pleasantly. Yeah. You know, yeah. because I would always be able to hum something that she knew. And you were clever enough to understand that. And it's what makes a difference in the lives of those who are going through those changes. Mm -hmm. Because it's not a, I'm sure it's not pleasant to be able to be without your remembrance. Mm -hmm. But what you can remember, why not make it as gay as possible? Exactly. She wasn't cognizant enough for me to, you know, to employ what you're talking about, storytelling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and actually, they say that when you have Alzheimer's, you have the, the old memories left. She didn't have anything left. Yeah, left because but, the gray matter had deteriorated, unfortunately. It is that yeah. disease that's going to rob you of everything that you remember mm. and that's okay i was telling a friend of mine that uh she was trying to help her aunt or whomever it was that's suffering to understand no that's i said what well, just just go along with it anyway she's not going to remember you said whatever you said just go along with it stop saying no that's not because they don't remember they really mm. don't so just whatever she says just go along with it and make it make it a conversation Exactly. Now, about your storytelling, what if, now you were talking about humor, all right, but well, what yeah. if someone wanted to, to tell a story dealing with something that's maybe we could say extremely serious, like um, the, maybe there's going to be a meeting, people who are belonging to Black Lives Matter. Okay. So, yeah. Do you deal with really super serious subjects as... Um, well, let's just say Black Lives Matter. Just you know what I'm talking about. The audience. I understand. I personally do not simply because I'm chicken. That is hardcore, and I cry, and I cannot be a performer and crying on stage does not make it very effective. I understand. I choose those issues to let somebody else cover them. Mm. That's fair. I mean, it's I, good to know. Since I know me, I yeah. do, there are some stories I won't tell simply because they, they hurt. They hurt. Mm -hmm. And yes, they need to be told. I'm just mm -hmm. not the one to tell them. I understand. Because there are stories that old people will tell that you'll remember that not all of them are happy. Oh, a, no. lot, of them are, a lot of them are great ways to, to learn about life. And when we talk about serious subjects. Of course, there are a lot of modern day stories that are worth repeating. But again, not everybody is, I mean, you know what area you're, you're willing to cover. Yeah. I, I know what works for me. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And that's fine. I'm the same way. Um, someone told me when I was first starting my paper that I needed to, to have some gossip and some, some, um, let's just say lower level. Okay. Garbage. Garbage. Mm -hmm. He said, nobody's going to read it if it doesn't have some tr kind of trash in there. And I was like, no, I have to really do this my way. Yeah. You know, I never listen to gossip anyway. I don't yeah. like gossip. And you don't want to spread that kind of malicious behavior anyway. Is that If that's all you want to do, you know, mm, I know garbage sells. I just don't buy it and I don't spill it out. Same here. So you don't dispense it with, with your stories and I don't dispense it with my newspaper. I want things to be positive, uplifting. I want to plant seeds of hope, happiness, mm -hmm. joy, possibilities, and I don't want anything else. I know other things exist. I know they're out there, but mm -hmm. I don't want to be the one that's spreading it. Mm -hmm. One thing I would like to see, because I love stories. Like I said, I grew up hearing stories from my grandfather and whatnot. When I worked at, I used to work at a place called Sergeant and Lundy. And that was an engineering firm in Chicago. Extraordinarily diverse place to work. Okay. That's ridiculous. 
And from listening to people talk, I realized that although Chicago is a very, very segregated place full of uncertainty and prejudice because everyone's unfamiliar with each other, we, we, we are all in our own little communities, okay? okay. Um, not like other cities like London and LA where I hear people of different races live together. I don't know how true that is, but Chicago's not like that, all right? Except for maybe a couple of neighborhoods. So, oh no, I lost my train of thought. Okay, wait. Oh, so working, <laughs> so working as Sergeant in Lundy, where, like I said, is extraordinarily diverse. I would occasionally hear stories that people were telling and I realized, like you were saying, many stories that are across different races and whatnot are similar. Um, I have heard stories, like for example, there was this guy, he was um, the head of the graphics department. He was Polish, Polish American. He told us that his, the first family member to come to this country was lost. They, the family saved their money in Poland. They gave it to his uncle. I mean, his, yeah, his uncle. He was supposed to go actually to Canada and do well and bring the rest of the family over. Yeah. They, they never heard from him again. Wow. So they saved money up again and sent his dad. And this one was successful. Okay. And so, uh, so Bob was telling that tale. And I was just thinking of how many people have that same story, even talking about black people who came from the South. There are so many black people who stowed away on trains to go West. And Great to go to migration. North. Yeah. I mean, some of us went, you know, with the regular bus tickets and train tickets and whatnot. Others stowed away. Okay. You know what I mean? And of course, we know that Hispanics and Asians and all kinds of different people have come have come here under many different circumstances. I wish we could share those stories together so that we could understand that pretty much all of us, except maybe Native Americans, have come over here under really interesting circumstances. And we all have not the same story, but stories that we can all relate to. You know, I think that would really help with race relations. That would, because we need to hear other people's stories, and we will find that many of them are very, very similar. What do people mm -hmm. want? They want good health, great jobs. They want their children to be successful. They want a home or a community that they can feel comfortable in and enjoy and grow. And mm -hmm. that's what we want, to enjoy a great life. America is a wonderful place to live. Until you've been someplace else and lived there or stayed there for a while, you don't realize how wonderful this country is and how many opportunities are available compared to other places in this world. You know, I was listening to BBC, you know how they have the news at nine o'clock on WNC. Okay. So and now, Growing up here in the USA, I was just accustomed to hearing of people who, I mean, I had so many neighbors who were former sharecroppers and whatnot. Okay. Chicago has lots and lots and lots of people from Mississippi. Okay. Okay. So I'm used to hearing about people who were sharecroppers and they grew up to become doctors or whatnot and people who came from modest backgrounds and achieved yes. this. I'm used to that. Okay. But here I am listening to BBC and there was a family from... Syria, they had found their way into England. They, they had escaped refugees. Okay. They settled in Italy in England. He asked the young son, he was a teenager uh, or almost a teenager. He was asking the young man what he wanted to do in the future. And the young man, his job was um, working in a restaurant. He was flipping, I guess you call it flipping burgers or whatever. All right. Not What's it? They had a... Um, What's it called? Um, falafel or something? Falafel. Anyway, falafel or something. Anyway, he was flipping food. <laughs> okay. Okay. So he said that he planned to become a doctor. And the the BBC guy, the British guy, was incredulous. He was like, flipping falafels to become a doctor? And he asked that several really? times. He says, are you serious? You? Really? I was like, what? I mean, I've never heard anyone at BBC really question anybody like that. But I was shocked 
as a North American to hear that the guy could not believe that this gentleman could go from flipping food to becoming a doctor. That's such a typical, almost typical yeah, story. For that's a very average story for America. But apparently not even in Britain, Great Britain is it common, I guess. I don't know. That's something. I'm telling you, can I say I love my country? I love my country, USA. Works for me, babe. You know, that's right. Definitely. This has been wonderful. Isn't this fun with Blab? Now, we don't have a lot of viewers. In fact, we don't have any viewers right now. There will okay. be viewers in the replay. But I guess as I gain popularity, I hope I do. Yes. I will gain viewers. Yay. Um, so now, Blab is very new, and most shows only have from two to ten viewers at a time anyway. All right. So so it's cool. I, I intend to continue doing this, and I intend to um, you have to you have to try something and then you have to keep at it if you want to be successful with it. I agree 100 percent. Rome yep. wasn't built in a day and you cannot get it all in 20 seconds. Exactly. <laughs> and one important thing I learned today was don't do your laundry while doing a show. <laughs> Sounds wise to me, Chick. I hope you didn't hear all that tumbling. Uh, you know how you know how things are when, when your machine is unbalanced and it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So anyway, so don't do that, folks, ladies and gentlemen. So Willa, thank you so much for being on the show. I really well, thank you it. for the invitation to be here. I need to send my buddies your way because they love to yak too. And I love the way you interact and share them and give them an opportunity to just spill their guts. Tell me what you do and how you do. Life I, is I, good. I would love to do that. I started out on radio. Um, I went from radio to online, uh, whatever this is, with Google Plus and now Blab. Okay. okay. And also, I'll tell you, in case you didn't know, TV Skywriter, sure, it, it airs live and then I put it up on YouTube, but also airs on uh, the People's Channel in Durham and Chapel Hill. Yowza. Touche. See? Well, so, thank you very much. Absolutely. Did I say willowbrigham.com? <laughs> say it again. Say it again. Willowbrigham.com. Have contract, will travel. Yes, you need me and I'm available. Give me a call. Send me an email. I'll I'm, get right back to you when I can. And I'm finishing up the December issue. It's never too late to get into the December issue because now, even though it's a monthly and it's out, the December issue is out, but I update it every day, which is so much better than being wow. on paper. And it was on paper, but once it was printed, that was it. Done. But now that it's online, I can, people can send me stuff and I can say, as soon as I hang up, I'm putting this in. Flexibility. That there works. And it's not too late to, advertise, not too late to advertise folks. If you want to do that, you can just contact me via Twitter at Durham Skywriter. And please read the Durham Skywriter, DurhamSkywriter.com. With that, thank you so much, Willa. Thank you, Patty. And I'll see you real soon. Take care now. Bye-bye. Okay, folks. I'll see you tomorrow, folks. I do Periscope every morning. I do Bull City Notes. That's where I announce what's happening here in Durham, North Carolina. So you can check that out on Periscope around 10-ish. So follow me on Twitter and Periscope at Durham Skywriter. And where should they follow you? Do you have Twitter, Willa? I have Twitter, willabrigham.com. There you go. So follow, so at Willa Brigham. At Willa Brigham. Mm -hmm. There you go. With that, see you later, folks. See you later, Willa. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Who will jump up and down with you? Turn around and tie your shoe. Willa, 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 Will. Who will sing a zany song? Row boats on the lake and take you along. Willa, Willa, Willa.